Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Once again, social media is full of images of a rocket booster which has crashed into somebody's house in China. This is a booster from a Long March 3B which launched a pair of Beidou satellites on Saturday. The launch site is Qichang, which is built in the mountains thousands of miles inland, primarily because the Chinese space program began during the Cold War and security was a big deal. Like the US and the USSR, China's space program began as a spin-off from their ICBM development. During the 1950s, China had direct assistance from the Soviet Union in rocket development, but this stopped after the Sino-Soviet split of 1960. It would be only weeks then before Chinese scientists actually launched their own homegrown missile. In 1970, China launched their first satellite using a Long March 1 rocket. Essentially, this was a DF-4 Dongfeng-4 ICBM with an extra third stage that was a solid rocket motor. This historic vehicle was about 30 meters tall and massed 80 tons, with the first two stages powered by YF-2A engines, burning a mixture of unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, or UDMH, and nitric acid. Each engine developed about 27 tons of thrust and they had four of those engines on the first stage and a single engine on the second stage. And the third stage was a two-ton spin-stabilized solid rocket motor. And this vehicle was able to put the 300 kilogram Dongfang Hong satellite into Earth orbit, where it actually remains to this day. The Long March 1 would launch only one more payload before it was retired. I should probably mention that while the rockets are named Long March in English, they take the name Chang Zheng, or CZ, in uh, China. The name recalls the Long March of the Red Army as it tried to evade the forces of General Chiang Kai-shek and ultimately regroup. This event cemented Mao Zedong as uh, the leader and it became a cornerstone of the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda. The Long March 2 was a big step up. It was based on the DF-5 missile. It was more than twice the size of the Long March 1, clocking in at 190 tonnes fully fuelled. It had two stages burning UDMH and nitrogen tetroxide. The engines were now YF-20 engines with four on the first stage and one on the second stage. Each of these engines would generate 70 tonnes of thrust. The first launch in 1974 was unfortunately a failure, but a year later, the slightly upgraded Long March 2A launched and then launched again. All of the payloads at this time were FSW reconnaissance satellites, which I previously mentioned because their re-entry heat shields were made of impregnated oak. Now, around the same time, there was another rocket called the Fengbao-1, which had been developed in parallel with the Long March 2 for political reasons. It shared the same uh, DF-5 ancestor and it had similar performance. The Feng Bao made eight orbital attempt, launch attempts over its career with only eight of them being successful. The Long March 2C stretched the propellant tanks to improve performance, bringing the wet mass up to 230 tonnes. It first launched in 1982 and is still flying today, having launched 51 times with only one failure. It has an optional solid rocket third stage to uh, improve performance again. That makes it the 2CSD. That variant was actually used in the 1990s to launch a dozen Iridium satellites. The third stage is also capable of putting some small satellites into geostationary transfer orbit. Now, the Long March 2D isn't a direct evolution of the Long March 2. It's a Long March 4, so we will get back to that later. But the Long March 2E was a big deal. It added four liquid-fueled radial boosters, supporting a lengthened core and second stage. The vehicle now massed 460 tons and it could deliver nine tons to low Earth orbit. However, it suffered from design problems with excessive vibration and structural weakness in the payload fairing that actually destroyed a couple of satellites. Now, while that was bad for those satellites, the consequences would ultimately affect the entire Chinese space program. The satellite manufacturer, Hughes Space and Communications, offered to help China fix the problems with the rocket and its weak fairing. But this caused great con political controversy in the US. 
and it was asserted that the information could then be used to improve Chinese rockets and ballistic missiles. So in 1998, the US Congress reclassified satellite technology as a munition and placing it under uh, ITAR. This made it impossible for most satellites to launch on Chinese rockets and essentially cut out China from most of the commercial launch market. So the Long March 2E was retired, but the 2F, which is largely based on the same layout, is the primary launch vehicle for China's human spaceflight program, carrying both the Shenzhou spacecraft and the Tiangong stations. So that's the Long March 2 series. Don't worry, the, all the others don't have nearly as many variants. So the Long March 3 is the obvious next step. It took the Long March 2C and it added a hydrogen-oxygen upper stage, powered by a newly designed YF-73 engine. It was designed to put uh, about 1.3 tonnes into geostationary orbit, and it operated from 1984 to 2000. Notably, it was used to launch AsiaSat-1, which had previously been launched on the space shuttle as Westar-1, but after it failed to boost into geostationary transfer orbit, another space shuttle crew went up rescued the satellite, returned it to Earth where it was refurbished. And that then was launched on a Chinese rocket after the company lobbied the US government to get a license. And Reagan at the time was very big on engaging China and started allowing these launches. And that set the precedent for the next few years, obviously, until the Long March 2E incident. So the Long March 3 was then superseded by the 3A, which made everything bigger, bigger propellant tanks and improved performance overall. The engines are still derived from those YF-20 engines. They now have a new designation YF-21, but they're basically the same thing burning UDMH and NTO. The performance with the extended tanks is now 2,500 kilograms to geostationary orbit. And the first launch of that was in 1994. And again, the vehicle is still in operation today. You've probably noticed by now, by the way, that the engine designations all begin with YF. And I understand that this means Yeti Fadong or, in, or liquid type engine. And you've also noticed by now that my Chinese pronunciation is terrible. And I expect lots of comments telling me how to say things correctly. I admit I am not perfect. The Long March 3B added four liquid-fueled strap-on boosters, more than doubling the geostationary performance to 5.1 tonnes. In 2007, they then stretched this to make the B-E, bringing the performance up to 5.5 tonnes. Now, that meant the difference between the uh, Long March 3A was your 2.5 and the 3B was 5.5. That left a big gap if you wanted a geostationary satellite that was in the middle. So they came up with the 3C, and that's basically a 3B but with only two strap-on boosters instead of four. Okay, so that's enough of threes. Now it's the Long March 4A. There was no regular four. So that took the first and second stages of the 3A, but instead of a hydrogen oxygen upper stage, it switched it over to a hypergolic UDMH nitrogen tetroxide stage and uh, you know, providing 4.2 kilograms to low Earth orbit. That version only flew a couple of times, but the 4B and 4C still fly. I think the main difference between these is the size of the fairing, but it's hard to get information on it. And yeah, that brings us back to the Long March 2D. So again, they just took the first two stages of the 4A and put on a YZ3 or Yuang Zheng. Uh, that's a restartable upper stage that can be used to put satellites into you know intermediate orbits. And I believe that's a variant of the stage that's used by the Beidou satellites to put them into their intermediate altitude orbits. Roughly speaking, the family is grouped such that the Long March 2 have small or no third stages. The Long March 3 have the hydrogen upper stage and the Long March 4 have the large hypergolic third stages. So the Long March 2, 3 and 4 account for almost all of the launches from China. And they're all based on the same YF-20 series engines with its nasty hypergolic fuel. But the new generation of vehicles are switching over to cryogenic propellants. The YF-100 series engines burn kerosene and liquid oxygen in an oxidizer-rich staged combustion cycle. And they generate about 130 tons of thrust. The engine was pretty much developed by reverse engineering the RD120 with a handful of examples 
and a collection of documentation being acquired during the 1990s during the breakup of the Soviet Union. Anyway, the Long March 5 is a big step up in terms of launch capability. The design uses a two-stage hydrogen-oxygen core with four radially attached boosters burning kerosene and liquid oxygen. It has a launch mass of 867 tonnes and it's intended to be able to put 25 tonnes into low Earth orbit. And it'll be used to launch China's Tianhe space station. Uh, at this time, the Long March 5 is still considered to be in development having had two launches with only one partial success. It's also notable that these new launch vehicles are launching from Wang Chang, which is on Hainan Island, and therefore it drops the expanded stages into the sea. The Long March 6 is a small rocket using the YF-100 engine. It's uh, supposed to be able to put 1,000 kilograms into sun-synchronous orbit. It has a YF-100 in the first stage and a YF-115 vacuum-derived version for the second stage. And it's got a little small hypergolic stage. It's flown about three times right now, carrying lots of payloads. There tends to be you know, farms of CubeSats on each flight. The Long March 7 is supposed to be a more versatile launch vehicle with a two-stage kerosene liquid oxygen core and augmented by two or four radial boosters. And those boosters can either be solid or liquid repellent. There's also an option for a YZ-50 maneuver stage or a Hydrolox upper stage for those high energy GTO trajectories. As far as I can tell, there's not much information on the Long March 8 beyond statements that it's supposed to be a reusable launch vehicle. But the Long March 9, the in-development super heavy launch vehicle with a 10 meter diameter core, four radial boosters and new, more powerful engines. It's supposed to be capable of putting maybe 100 tons or more into low Earth orbit, giving China a vehicle that is capable of sending crews to the moon, at least when it begins flying in the 2030s. Is everybody keeping up? The final Long March is the Long March 11, and it is a four-stage solid rocket motor launch vehicle that doesn't need complex ground support for launch. Indeed, in June 2019, they actually launched one off a barge in the Yellow Sea. So that's all the Long March. Yeah, there's also a couple of uh, Chinese launch vehicles which aren't part of the Long March family. Uh, there's new commercial space providers in the form of Land Space, Link Space, One Space, X Space. And they're all trying to differentiate themselves from the government launch program, despite all having strong links to the government launch program. So far, only X Space has launched anything with their Kwaizu rockets. It's a small uh, solid rocket launcher derived from the DF-21 missile, which has launched eight times so far. In fact, twice this month from the same site, showing impressively fast turnaround time. And that rapidity is worth noting in another way. This year, China has launched 28 rockets, while US launch providers have only made 23 launches, and that includes the five Electron rockets that are launched from New Zealand. The Chinese launches are almost all Chinese payloads due to the difficulty in building spacecraft that can be licensed for export under current technology embargoes. Yep, it's difficult to talk about rocketry without getting into politics or speculating how this will play out. But it's clear that China is very much a world-class launch provider, largely restricted to only serving a small portion of the world market. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out in the coming decades. And I'm going to say also, as a rocket fan, I'm continuously disappointed by their lack of real-time coverage of their launches. And of course, zero transparency when things go wrong. And I don't expect that to change anytime soon. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.